Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, a podcast where we have fun talking about video games and video game music. I'm FM Synth Mike, and I'm YM Twenty Six O Ed. Oh, getting specific. Mm. And this is episode one hundred and seven, the PC ninety eight series. Yeah, the PC-9801, PC-9821, yeah. there's a couple different computers out there. Yes. So this is going to be an episode that's very reminiscent of, uh, like, episode 24, the Sharp X68000 sure. yep. focus. Mm-hmm. So this is a Japanese-based computer that was originally intended for, you know, doing homework or word processing or spreadsheets and stuff, and also had some game capabilities. But then the game capabilities took off with the Japanese market. And so hundreds and hundreds of games were made for this computer. Mm -hmm. Uh, The cool thing about it is it had a really cool FM sound chip and then got even cooler with an expanded sound chip. Mm -hmm. So there's so much music. Like, it was a treasure trove looking for music to put in this show. Yes. Uh, I I guarantee you, if if you're a fan of FM music, you're, you're going to have an absolute berserk treat time with this <laughs> with this episode berserk today. Berserk treat? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we will get into that in just a minute, but uh, first we're going to attack a couple pixel chat questions. That's a tongue twister. Yeah, seriously. So, first off, we have a question from Trevin Hughes. Uh, he also goes by... J- Dread. Dread? Dread. Dread. Dread, yes. And he asked if you could travel to a parallel universe where an underrated gaming console slash computer instead does well in the United States and you could experience this altered gaming history unfold, which console computer would you put in the spotlight and why, Ed? This is tough because I, I kind of love the underdogs. So that's good then because you would pick a yeah, system Yeah, like that... so uh, I would probably pick the 3DO. Okay. I think because I think it had a lot of potential that was never realized uh, in the United States. <laughs> there are some terrible games for it, but there's also some really good gems out there that True. Uh, just needed a little bit of polish. And I think if it had taken off a little bit more, if it hadn't debuted at such an incredibly high price, mm-hmm. uh, they could have tweaked their development kits. You know, they had an M2, which was like a 64-bit upgrade to the 3DO that was planned and actually came out in commercial markets but never hit the home market. Right. So. There would have been a successor to it. So I would really have liked to have seen uh, an actual U.S. game console manufacturer succeed because mm-hmm. Japan's overtaken the market. Yeah. And it would have been really cool to have something home-based that would have uh, put out some cool games. Panasonic made really awesome hardware, like mm-hmm. for their stereos and their speakers and stuff like that and their uh, receivers. I mean, like, I think I still have a Panasonic receiver downstairs in my basement yeah. here. So really top-notch hardware company uh so it's a shame that the 3do didn't take off i would say of those systems the 3do i would probably say is the like of the you know the jaguars the cdis the 3dos all those like systems that tried to compete with the super nes and the and the genesis or even the playstation one and the saturn yeah they just couldn't compete so I feel like the 3DO would probably be the best of the best of yeah. those like lower ended, yeah, the best contender. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you know, the Jaguar was just garbage. Yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> I can't imagine that system getting really good. You know, I, I just and I've, I've spent a lot of time playing those sure. games too, and there are some okay games for it, but just like the sound hardware wasn't there, the mm-hmm. controller was really meh. I and, hated and, that controller. And there was, we talked about yeah, that. Yeah, there were no 3D capabilities mm-hmm. that were worth talking about. So I just I didn't think that that system had the potential. Mm. And the CD add-on didn't expand the capabilities of the system. It mm-hmm. was literally just like sticking a Jaguar cartridge in the system with more memory because it was a CD. So okay. Okay. they didn't even have expansion in yeah, mind yeah. Like, like with the M2. So. Uh, I'm going to vote for the Dreamcast, though. Okay. Uh, See, be- I consider that a successful system. It was... I believe their worst selling system as far as at least for what money they dumped into it. Mm. And I think that the problem with the Dreamcast is a similar problem that the Wii U had, which is the system came out and it was mostly ports. It was a powerful system, but it also launched prior to higher ended systems that were on the verge of coming out. Yeah. And so it was right on that, like, it was better than the N64 and the PlayStation, but those systems had already been out for several years, so this was uh, releasing to a very flooded market in that sense, and most of the games that it got, aside from some really excellent exclusives, 
really just you know were ports. Yeah. Like yeah. either like so so okay ports or really phenomenal ports. Right. But if you are a hardcore gamer like Marvel vs. Capcom two, you know yep. you got arcade perfect ports. Definitely. Because Sega, who was like an arcade juggernaut at the time, mm-hmm. ran all their arcade games on what was basically a slightly expanded Dreamcast. Right. So you had Pixel Perfect sound perfect you mm-hmm. know arcade games in your own house which was kind of a first for that for that era yeah i i truly feel that if the dreamcast didn't have well two things one if it didn't have the capability to just burn games so mm-hmm. easily and two if sega of america and sega of japan played nice together there would have been much greater success for the dreamcast because the sega of japan really screwed over uh, the Saturn in America. Yep. But that's my vote. So what's what's our next question? Next question is from Mr. Chris Murray. He asks, which would win in a street fight and why? The Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis, the PC-98, coincidentally, <laughs> or the FM Towns? Yeah, we've been holding on to this question for a while. Okay, so if we're talking just purely in terms of hardware and we're like giving these consoles like human characteristics i'm gonna go with the genesis to be honest with you so fm town smart is gonna get its butt kicked like right away (laughs) and the reason for that is the three of them are gonna gang up and be like oh your name's fm towns marty and they're gonna beat them up well it's not the marty it's just the fm towns what's the difference between the towns and the marty the marty was a different system with a cd playing capability if i recall okay okay well i don't know i just fm towns i don't know that's that's a silly name, so they'd make fun of their name and be Fair like, enough. you're lame. Uh, Genesis has that blast processing, yeah. a.k.a. the uh, Motorola processor that True. it has in it. True. And that, that thing's a beast. So I really think that even though the Super NES is better looking and uses uh, all these special tricks and visual gadgets and things, you know, Mode 7, all that stuff, mm-hmm. I still feel like the Genesis would... Because it's scrappier, it would be able to beat up the Super NES. And Fair enough. the PC-98, I think, would get taken down by a Super NES and Genesis. And the reason for that is, I feel like the PC-98 would be, like, the big, bulky, you know, bully that, like, tries to get your lunch money, but, like, he's really slow. Just can't move very right, well. Right, and he's just, you know, he's just a giant refrigerator. So, even though... He also has a really fast processor in him. I feel like his weight is going to hold him back. Okay. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you okay. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to change anything you said because <laughs> I think you're right on the money. Yes. Yes. In, in the interest of time. Yes. So <laughs> let's move on to our third question yes. from Key Glyph from the VGM Jukebox. Hi, Emily. What totally unrelated bonus function do you wish one of your video game consoles had built into it? For example... A console that bakes pancakes while you play, oh. one that knits socks, or one that is also a reptile terrarium. Okay, okay. Uh, I would say if the Nintendo could really be a toaster, that'd be pretty amazing. I mean, you know, there's the big joke around that the NES, you know, they call the uh, the front-loading model, model the uh, quote-unquote toaster. Correct. Uh, which never really made any sense to me because who puts toast in and then presses down on the toaster uh, in that sense? So... <laughs> Uh, probably I would say the other version, uh, the top-loading Nintendo, would probably be a better fit for Toaster. Maybe, yeah. But, regardless of that, I would say the NES... As a Toaster. As a Toaster would okay. make a lot of sense. Interesting. Yeah. Or a Toaster Oven. That would work better, because then you could put a lot of different things in it. Right. You, you know? eat a pizza. Yeah. 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 I would like a console that is also an espresso machine. Okay. So I could make lattes. Which like during during loading screens, I could just kind of like steam <laughs> some foam okay. milk. Okay. Okay. Any console. I don't know what has long loading times. What has really long loading times? Like the original uh, PlayStation. Yeah. PS2 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So something something where there was a, a generous amount of waiting that needed to be done. Virtual boy. Um, <laughs> that would be hard to make lattes blind. <laughs> so I'd avoid that one. But, Third degree burns. Yeah. Be seeing red anyway. Yeah, yeah. Blisters on your hands. Yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, I think uh, I think an espresso machine. That way you can stay caffeinated and, you know, you could play into the wee hours of the morning because you mm-hmm. constantly have, like, shots of espresso you could do. Uh, you can just steam up some milk of your choice mm-hmm. and uh, have a nice little caffeinated coffee beverage while you play your games, which okay. is what I usually do at night anyway. So. That works. 
Everything's all together. Yeah, man. And then we'd be steam powered. Yes, that's true. So uh, that's true. Yeah, okay. and you can play Steam Hearts or mm-hmm. any other Steam Steam World dig. You can play any Steam related <laughs> game. Steam only. You can just steam run related Steam. Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it'd be a Steam <laughs> a Steam machine. Yeah, a Steam machine. <laughs> All right, so thank you to Chris, Trevin, and Keyglyph for the Pixel Chat questions. If you guys want to ask your own questions, please send us an email to pixeltunesradio at gmail.com with the subject Pixel Chat question, and we will answer them on a future podcast. That's correct. So let's talk a little bit about the PC-98 before we get into our first track. I'll we'll talk a little bit about the production and maybe some of the software that came out for it. So you guys are kind of... Uh, knowledgeable about it before we start listening to some of the cool music that came out for it. So, Mike, why don't you start us off? Absolutely. So, the system was released in October of 1982, and this was right after the success of the PC-8800 series the year prior. So, this computer system, not a console, it's a computer system, and it shipped with a 5 megahertz 8086 processor and 128 kilobytes of RAM. Woo! Ooh, monster! Woo! <laughs> It cost about 298,000 yen, uh, which equaled to about 1,200 1982 US dollars. So back in the day, (laughs) yeah, that was pretty pricey. Uh, Now there is a misconception about uh, the difference between the PC-98 and the PC-88. A lot of uh, non-Easterners, people in the US, people in Europe, uh, think that the 98 series came after the 88 had a run uh, but in reality, actually, they existed side by side. So kind of similar to like the NES and the Super NES. The games were still coming out for the NES while the Super NES was also coming out with brand new games as well. Yep. Uh, the 88 was produced from 1981 until 1989, and the N- PC-98 was produced from 1982 until 2000. Yeah, and it just like the X68000, the PC-98 grew in terms of processing power right. and RAM and storage space. Obviously, you couldn't be selling the same system in 2000 right, as you right. would in 82. Yeah, so. yeah. It needed a, a bit of hardware bumps as time went on. Exactly. And there were thousands of games that were produced for the system, despite uh, the fact that uh, you know a lot of these titles were mostly like visual novels and text adventures. And so the reason why we never really saw a lot of that here in the States is, one, the system uh, really didn't sell at all in in i mean i believe that it was able to be imported in but i don't think that many retailers actually sold it here in yeah the there States. was one vendor that sold it it wasn't nac who mm-hmm. created the 88 and the 98 um but it didn't do it because it had a proprietary system yeah so i mean it was originally designed as a business machine so yeah. it wasn't really that sort of thing that uh was noted for playing games initially but as time went on we started to see more and more games come out. Uh, so one of the reasons why it was mostly visual novels and text adventures is uh, due to the fact that it was very difficult to get lots of sprites moving around, like the X68000, which was very capable of doing that, right. uh, but not the PC-98. Yeah, it so. didn't have that, that Motorola 68000 processor. Right, really, exactly. It was kind so. of built for that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it wasn't fast enough. I don't think it just... You know, it, it was more designed for slower running games. So. Yeah, so visual novels were a great fit. Mm-hmm. Also, NEC kept their software proprietary, uh, like a game console manufacturer would, you know, like Nintendo. You had to get a license, sure, from Nintendo in mm-hmm. order to make Nintendo games. So you need to have a license to develop for their system, and other companies wouldn't be able to legally sell clones either. So, like, the IBM-compatible PCs means that you could just, you know, take the specs of an IBM and make your own, whereas with right. NEC, you needed to actually pay them and come out with a system under their guidance. Mm-hmm. Seiko Epson was the only company licensed to make clones and compatibles, um, so they were really successful before the IBM compatibles came out. So when Microsoft's licensing opened up and IBM-compatible clones hit the market, NEC could do very little to combat the cheaper hardware. That eventually caused the system's downfall, and with it, NEC kind of left mm. the PC market. So there's no you know, active PC-98 successor right. today. Uh, one of the reasons that the PC-98 did become so popular among current-day gamers is because of the Toho Project series of Dojin games, which started way back in 1996. And this was a series of Japanese bullet hell shooter games developed by one single person who goes by Team Shanghai Alice, but he calls himself Zoon. Mm. Um, and he wrote the game's music, he drew all the graphics, he programmed the game as like a one-man game machine. 
Uh, and those games are still being produced today. The last release was in late December of 2017. Uh, the Antimony of Common Flowers for, for Windows. Goodness. So, yeah, that series kind of is what kind of brought people's attention to the 98 in current day. And now they're kind of catching on to all these other games that are being translated from Japanese into English. So it's kind of seeing a little bit of a resurgence in the West, which is kind of cool. <laughs> the system is extremely expensive to collect for. Absolutely. So if you're planning on getting a working machine, good luck. You're going to need Especially one of the later of models with the power yes. behind it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, now as far as sound goes, we're going to talk about one of the two chips first, and we're going to play an example of music on that chip, and then we're going to move on to uh, the second more advanced chip and, and then talk about that one. So the first chip that the PC-98 shipped with was called the YM-2203, which was otherwise known as the OPN chip. So if you find music for the PC-98 on the web, you usually see OPN or OPN-A after it. OPN would designate the original chip that came with the 2203. This had three channels of FM synthesis and four operators per channel. An operator is basically uh, kind of like a virtual device that lets the chip manipulate the sound. So the more operators you have per channel, the more different instruments and sounds you can get. So like the Neo Geo, which had many more operators per channel, you'd be able to get many more different kinds of sounds. It would sound more rich. So the four operators on the 2203 is kind of in the medium range, so it, you couldn't get too many sounds out of it. Mm. It also had three channels of PSG sound via a built-in YM2149F, which is the same PSG chip that was in like the ZX Spectrum and the MSX. So that was kind of similar to like what was in the Sega Master System too. Okay. So you're kind of getting three channels of FM plus three channels of Master System style sound. The ZX Spectrum had stereo capability with that chip, but this was mono only. Hmm. Uh, and this was the original chip. So the majority of the games in the PC-98 library have OPN soundtracks or at least an OPN soundtrack option. Uh, and then the later games that came out, you would see they would have the more advanced sound option, but usually there would also be a uh, OPN version as well. The very, very late games only had the advanced option. But we'll right. talk about that chip after we get through this first track, which is amazing to listen to. So yes. what'd you pick for our first track? Michael? Yeah, so our first pick is a game called RAL 3, Kakusei Hen. And this came out in 1994. This is Battle 1, Winning Expectation, and it's by Mr. or Mrs. Unknown Composer. Oh, man.
Welcome back. That was Raw 3 Kakusehen, and that came out in 1994. That was Battle 1, winning expectation by Mr. or Mrs. Unknown. So, before we start talking any further, I think we should throw up a little disclaimer here. Blech. An audio disclaimer, saying that a lot of these games are very adult in nature. Yes. So, we're, you know, obviously not going to get completely graphic or gross or anything like that. We're going to try to keep it PG-13, much to Mike's chagrin. Uh. But if you regularly listen to Pixel Tunes Radio with your kids, you might want to maybe turn us off and come back to us when you're by yourself. I, I You know, I don't know how some of these game explanations, we're going to have to at least talk a little bit about some adult situations. So You're an I'm adult situation. Leave it up to the Pixel Tuners, uh, you know, their own choices as to whether or not they want to listen to this out in public or not. Like, yes. like I said, we're not going to get, like, gross, gross. Oh, man. Just... There my, are some questionable... Put my, put my blow-up doll away. Yeah, do that. <laughs> put all my um, Samus statues away. Send that 55-gallon drum of lube back <laughs> yes. to Amazon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this game, uh, first off, what do you think of the track? The track was great. I think it was a perfect introduction to this show because you've got that fantastic FM bass. Funky. You've got those great PSG melody lines, do 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 like up in the up in the top range. Yeah, and yeah. then that FM guitar solo towards the end of it. Uh, so all all the <laughs> it's, like a, it's like an FM chip It's like all stroke. over the place, I know. I know. So it's a great kind of description of how this YM2203 chip sounds. Uh, it's got a really nice funky feel to it. Like mm-hmm. I don't know. So this is like a visual novel. Yes, uh, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, yeah, about I'm just it. trying to think of like what kind of uh, uh, this situation the song would play in. Yeah, it never really fits when it comes to like the fact that these are visual novel games. Most of the tracks I picked are, no surprise, extremely high energy tracks. So, except for maybe like one or one or two ish hmm. ish, but this song in particular, just love how it kind of has this cool like driving vibe to yeah, it. yeah like i got a lot of like outrun at, at okay. points uh especially that synth that's kind of layered in the background that dun, 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 yeah dun, 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 dun. it reminds me a lot of like a level one or two from like a genesis shoot 'em up yeah or something yeah. like that yeah. especially with that with that bass line mm-hmm. so yeah you hear a lot of those familiar tones yeah so this is developed and published by fairy dust incorporated they pretty much only did these types of games. Visual these, novels. Yeah, these visual novels. There's a lot of companies that we're going to be mentioning today that uh, pretty much stuck to uh, developing and publishing only on like the Sharp X68000, PC98, Right, a lot of publishers PC88, exactly. Else. Right. Uh, let's define visual novel briefly too first. Yes. Uh, visual novel is exactly what it sounds like. It is mostly text yep. and pictures. Mm-hmm. And once in a while, you might have a decision to make where it might take kind of a choose-your-own-adventure kind of branch. Right, not... Uh, depending on the game. Kind of Some of them are very linear. F- like Phoenix Wright a little bit. Yeah, yeah. some of them are more like uh, like an RPG where you'll have like a decision tree and you mm-hmm. have to go to different people and talk to them and exhaust all your options. Yeah. Like uh, Deja Vu yep, or, yep. or Shadowgate or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, we talked about some of those when we uh, did the, the point-and-click adventure or yeah, adventure games that's right. episode. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. so visual novels are very ungame games. Right, yes. With varying degrees. But there are a few action games sprinkled in mm-hmm. and out of this show as well. But when we say visual novel, that's kind of what we mean. Yes. Um, so why don't you go on with yeah. the description? Yeah, so the heroine in this game, uh, her name is, I guess, Charon? Charon? Karen. Either Karen or Charon. I don't know. And uh, she's a descendant of a legendary swordsman, and she has to defeat this cruel monster named Gabalzo. <laughs> it's like a dyslexic gazebo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's uh, the leader of uh, something called the Shadow Empire. The whole point is to save the princess of Rawl, who was abducted, and her name is Rubina. Rawl 3 Kakusehen is based on the adult anime called Super Dimension SF Legend Rawl, which came out in 1984. And uh, essentially, this is uh, the third episode of Rawl, if you will, or SF Legend Rawl. Hmm, uh, it's a reimagining of actually the first episode or the first uh, version that came out. Uh, as we said before, it is an adult visual novel, so leave the kitties at home. Uh, gameplay is mostly consisting, uh, as you know, we said prior, making choices, deciding where you're going to go, 
choosing various different destinations that you can pick from, like a castle, villages, caves, mansions, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so you have a map screen that you can go to, and you can move Karen uh, all over the place to advance the story. And in some, at some points during the game, the heroine has to encounter an enemy, and uh, the player fights the enemy by making decisions, basically choices, uh, such as attack, defend, you know, run, etc., that sort of thing. Uh, however, the heroine always wins irrespective of the player's decisions. Interesting. So it's like a pseudo-RPG kind of Kind deal. of, yeah. I mean, no matter what it sounds like you win, it's yeah. more like what happens during the battle. Right. And since this is a adult anime and adult visual novel, I'm it's suspecting... Basically gonna depend on how much clothes you have on after you beat the enemy. Exactly, right. Either that, or it's going to be more of the sort of thing where it's like, uh, how, how is... How is what she going? What condition you're in at the end Right, of right. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, PC ninety eight. Yeah. So that yeah. that is the that is the game in and of itself. Interesting. Yeah. Did you did you look at any of the art? Do you know what the it's? I mean, style it's is? it's uh, kind of similar to like um, I don't want to say Kia Asamiya's work from like Silent Mobius. But it does kind of have that vibe a little bit. I mean, it's just like a bunch of blonde girls running around. So fair enough. You know. That is what it is. Cool. That's anime for you. So that's all I got. And we don't know who the composer is, but this is an OPN track, as we said before. So now we're going to move into an OPNA track, and then we'll come back from the break, and we'll tell you a little bit about that chip as well. So, Ed, what do you got for us? Next up on our list is a game called Ningyo Tsukai 2, uh, which actually did get a localization in the U.S. on DOS called Metal and Lace 2. Oh. This was developed by Forrest and came out in 1996. The track is called Versus J Mantis by Hideki Higuchi. All right, you're listening to Versus J Mantis from Ningyo Tsukai 2, otherwise known as Metal and Lace 2. Developed by Forrest, came out in 1996 on the PC-98 using the OPNA sound chip. I love this track. Yeah. I really enjoy that 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 bass line, that dun 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 dun. It's got a nice groove to it, which immediately captures my ear. I'm all about the groove. Yep, yep. Uh, and then you've got some really cool guitar solos. I think that's a good parallel between the first track you played and the first track I played. Right. They have that same kind of instrument. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a like a low, overdriven kind of guitar sound, uh, with some like you know wanky guitar picky solos mm -hmm. going on in there. What'd you what'd you think of it? Right before the track, like shortly before the track loops, you notice that one of the melodies goes up an octave. Mm. So it's kind of like that dun 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 and then it kind of goes like dun 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 dun. It's like it, it rises up a little bit, uh, which, I, which I really enjoyed. Overall, I really dug this track. I love that groove as well. It's really just like full and rich. And even the drums here are kind of, they they didn't really like go anywhere. You know what yeah. I mean? I kind of wanted them to do 
something else, but they definitely kept the beat, kept the pace going, and kept it fresh. So I was I was down for this track. It was great. Yeah, it's a it's a fighting game. It's this is this is like a one on one fighting game, similar to Street Fighter, Mortal okay. Kombat, etc. So uh, I think as far as like the percussion goes, they wanted to keep it a little bit flat because sure. there was a lot of sound effects going on, people hitting each other and little vocal samples here and there. Yeah, and this is not like the Amiga where you have to pick and choose between like There's like four music. channels on the Amiga. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Segwaying directly into that, we can talk a little bit about this new chip that we just listened to, the YM2608. So this is otherwise known as the OPNA chip. It's got 16 channels of sound. Boom. So we're expanding 10 channels over the 2203 at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, six of those channels are FM sound channels, and now they've got eight operators as opposed to four in the last one. So you've got more ways to manipulate, make different ingredients, so make different instruments for each of those six channels. More pocket calculators. Exactly. More <laughs> operators and pocket calculators. <laughs> I got the joke. Yes. It's got the same YM2149F that the 2203 has, so that ZX Spectrum PSG chip is still there. It's got one single channel for 8-bit ADPCM samples like uh, voice, anywhere from like 2 to 16 samples. kilohertz so any kind of samples mm -hmm. yeah sound effects uh, voice samples drum samples all sorts of stuff yeah well drums is interesting because mm. there's a rhythm sound source in this chip baked in mm. so it's got six channels of adpcm and the percussion samples are already in the chip. Mm -hmm. So developers and song composers don't have to go out and sample their own percussion instruments. Okay. They're already in the memory of the chip. Hmm. So all they need to do is basically play like, you know, figure out patterns that they want their drums to go in. As long as they have the right driver for it, they can access those drum sounds. And so uh, you're going to hear all of the percussion with the OPNA. Sounds a lot like each other yeah. uh, because they're all the same drum sounds. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty good drum set. And you can play them at different tones, so you can get a low tom or a high tom. Right. So percussion works out pretty well. There's some hi hats and some cymbal crashes as well. But that one ADPCM channel, that you can raise and lower in tone. So you can use that as voice samples for your fighting games. You can do, um, you know, digital sound effects for cutscenes, or you can use it along with your music and have it raise and lower if you want, like a piano or a harp or a right. flute sound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, it's going to be kind of rudimentary. You're not going to have very many notes available to you but you'll be able to use it along with your music mm -hmm. as well. So uh, it's a really good chip. It's probably my favorite FM chip out there just because of the volume of amazing music that yeah, came out for it. I'm going to agree. I think most of the tracks that I picked are OPNAs. Yeah. And I just I think the sound itself is much more full, much more rich, and just really vibrant. Exactly. Really stands out. There was one modified version of this chip called the YMF288, otherwise known as the OPN3. That came out in the later PC98 sound cards. Uh, that removed the ADPCM channel and some of the rarely used uh, GP in and out ports on the chip as a cost cutting measure. Uh, and it was a little bit faster and required less power to run. So the trade off was pretty good. Uh, that ADPCM channel was starting to get used less and less because the later PC98s had CDs in them and they were mm -hmm. starting to play CD audio instead. Right. So for a bit more of a detailed look at the YM2608, check out Pixelated Audio number 47. They did a full episode on a visual novel called Ground Seed, and they did a really in-depth look at the 2608, so mm -hmm. it's definitely worth a listen. Uh, you can also listen to Pixelated Audio 66, where they did an interview with Masahiro Kajihara, who uh, was a composer for a lot of the PC-98 yes. games that came out. I think we've got a couple of we do. songs from him in him. this episode. Hey, uh, Brian and James will take that check now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, well, that's a great episode because he explains a lot about how a composer looked at the chip, you right. know, aside from just the hardware, but the software that was available to him to create music on mm -hmm. it. So both are very, very educational, and they're, yeah. they're great episodes as well. Absolutely. So yeah. Check them out. Another fun fact about the YM2608 is that the 2203 and the 2608 are the first two in the OPN series of chips, which later included the OPN2 in the Sega Genesis, the YM2612, and the OPNB in the Neo Geo, which is the YM2610. And uh, those are probably the two more well-known FM chips in the U.S., yeah. I would say. So these are kind of like the predecessors to the chips that we know yes. and love in the mm -hmm. FM systems that came out Indeed you over do. here. So kind of a fun coincidence. I agree. So our next game is Rhyme Star, and this is 1994's release. And the track is World 12, and that's by Takeshi Abo. And the sound chip is an OPNA. So let's give it a listen.
right, welcome back. That was Rhyme Star, and the track was World 12. This is the 1994 release by Takeshi Abo, and that was the OPNH uh, sound chip. And Rhyme Star, yeah, this track, honestly, this was one I held on to, and I wasn't sure if I was going to pick it or not, but I listened to both tracks side by side that I was, you know, kind of picking between, and I said, you know what? This other track is really good, and I've mostly picked like really high energy tracks, and I wanted to pick something that started off a little more subtle mm. and kind of built up. And so I shelved the original track, picked this one, and I really dig this track. It definitely has like a Castlevania kind of vibe in the beginning of that. I was gonna say I pictured like Takeshi Abo like in full anime style, like working feverishly at a keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like it, it pans over to a little bit, and then like there's Mishiro Yamane like in the corner in the shadows, <laughs> like going, "Yes, my son." Yeah, Perfect. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this track, yeah, I mean it. It starts off with that very Castlevania-ish kind of style uh, with the up and down keyboard runs and then it kind of uh, moves into this very like groove oriented jam and I really love the drums here, particularly the snare drum. Mm. I think it's really tight yeah, it's very and tight. sharp sounding. But I wish that the cymbals were a little louder, and I also wish that the bass was a little more prominent. Because if you really pay attention and listen to the bass in the background, it's doing some really crazy stuff. And some other tracks that I picked on this episode, they move the bass kind of like to the front lines of the track. Whereas in this track, it, it kind of takes like a back seat so, in a way. So, yeah, a little bit about that. As far as levels go, I mean, mm. all of the music that we're listening to is pretty much emulated. Yeah. So it's you know it's hard to get your hands on a PC ninety eight like we talked about earlier to <laughs> record audio directly whoa, whoa. from the system. You don't have like seven hundred dollars to yeah. find a working machine. So when you have a when you have a chip with so many different parts like this, sometimes it's and because the people that are working on the emulation of these mm -hmm. chips don't actually own a real system, right? It's hard to get those levels sounding exactly like they did coming out of a PC ninety eight speaker. Yeah. So perhaps the drums were louder in the original version. I don't Possibly. know. You know. Uh, to kind of piggyback off that, when I was working on the Dude You Haven't Played This Game episode for Rusty, uh, which is another PC-98 mm -hmm. game, the music in that online, pretty much almost every single version of that music is sped up. It's too fast. Yeah. Whereas there are a few, a handful of recordings for the music that were recorded directly off of a PC-98. So, And those are normal. So it's like the in-stage tracks are slower on that, but then the like cutscenes are way faster. Did I tell you mm. that two days before you released that episode, yes. uh, VGM Rips came out with an official or official oh, no way. VGM pack for okay. Rusty at the proper speed okay. that plays in like Winamp or whatever you want That's to. Awesome. So now there's a real version of it out there. Okay. So we don't have to worry about speed issues anymore. Yes. We can go to the, the actual, you know, the quasi-official source. Right. Yeah. yeah, also to note, which I didn't note about the chip in the previous break is that now we're in stereo so we've got some stereo effects right. going on mm -hmm. uh, you can hear like the hand claps and a lot yep. of the different sounds he really uh, brought a lot of the different sounds that that were baked into the chip into this that snare being really heavy i haven't heard snare like that in other pc 98 tracks with, yeah. the, with the opna so that might be on that special uh, adpcm that sample. channel yeah so he might have recorded his own snare sound and put it in there makes sense to get a little extra oomph to that percussion yeah like you were talking about it's very castlevania feel mm -hmm. uh even that that melody gave me a very like bloodlines or like yeah. early like gba or ds mm -hmm. castlevania feel to it definitely as soon as i heard this song for the first time when, when you when you put it on our list i was like yeah this is a mic track yeah, for sure yeah, i yeah, can tell yeah. why you definitely picked it absolutely uh so takeshi abo worked on Quite a bit of stuff. He's been working even uh, right up until fairly recently. Uh, just he, yesterday. Just yesterday. He started off with Might and Magic Clouds of Zine in 1993. Uh, he also worked on The Legend of Carandia 1, 2, and... Did he do 3? No, he did not. So he must have done the Japanese computer implementations? That's what I'm thinking. Because Frank yeah. Lepaki wrote those soundtracks Correct. originally. Yep. So maybe he handled the yeah, recording of the music. We talked about Frank Klopaki quite a bit on the uh, point-and-click adventure. Yep. 
episode. Uh, Pepsi Man and Dead of the Brain 1 and 2, he did sound effects before he jumped back onto music with My Merry May in 2002. Uh, he also worked on Summon Night Grand Thieves in 2010. Phantom Breaker Battlegrounds in 2015. Uh, I believe that was the music that was... There were two different versions of that soundtrack. One actually sounded very similar to PC-98 hardware, okay. uh, which was a downloadable, like you could download the version of that soundtrack. I have the game on PS4. Came out afterwards as like a digital download, and you can pay extra money, like maybe five bucks, and get an extra character. But you also, on top of that, get the extra DLC music, which makes all the music sound like Genesis oh, style music, neat. like okay. FM synth, like Yuzo Koshiro did with right. like, some of his DS titles. Yep. Cool. But a lot of the uh, music in Phantom Breaker Battlegrounds is mostly like NES kind of inspired, okay, kind of like Wavetable. But then it's got a toggle switch where you can go back and forth between the okay. two, and it's awesome. Yeah. it's a really phenomenal soundtrack. Yeah, Takeshi Yabo is actually probably the only composer we've got today that has That's still done a working. lot of games that is still working and has also released games in the U.S. Yes. Like, we've heard his music in U.S. games. That's true. His last game was Mega Dimension Neptunia 7 on the, uh, I believe, the PS4, and that was a 2016 game by so Mages Inc. So, shoot him up, I think. Yes. I believe he was part a part of a group called Mages Inc., and they're credited for it, but okay. he's in that group. Gotcha. So, that is... The deal. Now, as far as the game itself goes, real quick, it's a it's a game where you have to pit like uh, monsters against each other in an Othello style board game battle, and uh, there's card battles to determine like if a square is taken. That was honestly the only information that they could get okay. about the so game. So it's not a visual novel, at least. No, it's not kind of a visual like a novel. Board puzzle game. Kind of, yeah, like a like a choose your card game. I don't know. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of these games I couldn't find gameplay footage of, nor could we yeah. find the, you know, uh, ability to play the game in most cases, so we'll do the best we can. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I have access to a PC-98 emulator and a lot of the games, but even so, it's They're like very these, unplayable. there's so much Japanese yep. to go through, and I just, you know, don't understand enough to be able to... So with the visual novels especially, you're just looking at a picture and some text on the bottom, and you don't have any real context... Very true. It, so. Speaking of visual novels, what do you got next for us? Next up is Zatsuan Ryuiki, developed by D.O. in 1994. This is Introductory Scene Highway from Ryuichiro Fujisawa and Hiro Tachibana.
Hello, we're back. That was Zatsuan Ryoiki, the introductory scene highway by Ryoichi Fujisawa and Hiro Tachibana. That was a visual novel that was developed by the company D.O. and came out in 1994. I guess I get introductory scene highway out of this. Yeah. It's definitely a driving song. It's like a relaxing nighttime drive. So speaking of, you know, what we were just talking about before we went into the song, I did load this game up, Mm -hmm. and it was one of the only games that, as as far as visual novels that I picked (laughs) for the show, one of the only games I did did load up. Right. And uh, luckily enough, the song that I had already picked was the very first track that plays as soon as you start the game. And it's a scene of, uh, it's there's text on the bottom, but it's showing like um, the protagonist's view, like a first person view of you in a red convertible driving on a highway. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And it, and it does fit the scene very well. It's got a, you know, kind of a very airy, you know, if this were an action game or a game on the Genesis or something, it would play like, you know, during a cut scene before the game started when everything was happy, dory, donkey, and, mm-hmm. you know, then your girlfriend gets kidnapped or okay. something. Okay, okay. Um, I picture like the beginning of these three when Adol and Doki are kind of like walking and then they meet the lady with the crystal ball like before that before all that crap right. goes down right right it's a very upbeat kind of a heroic tune and that's that's where this kind of goes with me it's interesting because I got more of a laid back vibe actually it was a little bit more relaxed sounding mm. um, maybe it was just yeah, I guess heroic isn't the term I really meant. I, yeah. I, I do agree with you on that mm. relaxed part yeah I breezy it's it, breezy there you go I for whatever reason, picture the soundtrack to Side Pocket on the Genesis in my okay. head. And the very opening title screen on Side Pocket is a picture of, it's like a girl in a dress or whatever, mm-hmm. and she's standing in front of like a, a convertible or whatever. And, you know, you see Side Pocket, the logo and all that. So what I picture in my head is this track is playing and she's driving down the highway and then she gets out of the car and she stands there and she's posing. Side Pocket appears and then the first track for Side Pocket Oh, perfect. So, like, this track could really be right out of side pocket for me. <laughs> I don't know. It's got that breezy, fun, relaxed vibe. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that works out pretty well. Makes you want to go, ah. Like when you're selecting your radio station for OutRun before yes, it starts. Yes, exactly. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about these composers. Ryoichiro Fujisawa, who was the lead composer on the soundtrack... He worked for D.O. from 1991 until roughly 2002. While he was there, he composed music for their D.O.R. and Yuju Senki series of visual novels. He also did a couple titles like Brand Marker and Crystal Renal. Brand Marker. Yeah, in 2001 and 2002, shortly before he left, he was the director of Crescendo Ayen Dato Omate Ito Ano Koro. I'm sure Brian from Pixelated Audio is going to murder me for that one. And Sumeragi no Miko Tachi. So uh, he not only was a composer, but he was also a director of mm. some of these visual novels, which mm. was pretty cool. Uh, Hiro Tachibana, he briefly worked for Dio only in 1994, and he worked alongside Fujisawa on this title and Crystal Renal. You keep saying Dio, and all I picture is like Ronnie James Dio. Oh, it's D period O <laughs> yeah, <yeah>. period. <laughs> Not like Dio God or anything like that. Right, right, right. I can't find much in the way of the, the description for this game, um, but the game does feature some of the best artwork ever seen on the PC 98. Uh, so there's a, a game director by the name of Hirosaki Yui. He was the artist and the game's writer, and he still makes visual novels today. Mm-hmm. His latest release was as a composer, scenario writer, and artist for uh, Shoku Shokun in November of 2017. His his artwork is absolutely amazing. He does so much with kind of like, you know, the PC-98 had a decent palette to work with and it yeah. was quasi good resolution, but his artwork is just, it's really, really nice. Um, the the It's kind of like Neo anime, so the, they're not like so cartoony and crazy like, like Sailor Moon. They're mm. a little more, the smaller eyes, bigger mouths, um, but kind of a very dark, muted color palette yeah um, it looks more realistic in the sense that it's like it's not like brown like muddy yeah. colors it's more like like regular everyday colors that you would see in very in, earthy right right earth earth tones if you will what what is the deal though with some of these images i mean this is again like an adult visual novel uh but there's a scene where uh, i suspect it's a guy and a girl kissing and the girl just Looks like she's about to like cry. <laughs> like I never. I know it's a it's cultural very emotional. thing. I know it's a cultural thing, but I never did understand that 
aspect of like, oh my god, I love you so much, I'm going to cry. It's a very like, yeah, specific thing that you see in a lot of anime and a lot of like love scenes. And maybe it's just them trying to portray like love. I, I don't know. It's very, overcome with emotion. Yeah. Anime characters get very overcome with emotion I, very often. I, I think anime it has to focus on uh, making things more outlandish then you know everything's exaggerated yeah everything's yeah. exaggerated everything's elaborated so yeah uh you know i have no context for these uh pictures that were that mike and i are looking at on this on this uh website actually there is a website called uh the visual novel database uh vndb.org and you can go there and look up some of these titles and you'll at least get a, a couple screenshots maybe some staff members that worked on it it's kind of a site that we've kind of used for this episode to kind of get some information about these games because mm -hmm. so little of it is available right. so uh yeah do yourself a favor if you're interested in this stuff or want to check out some of the games that we featured as far as the art goes uh go check out vndb.org so yeah like i said i i don't really have context for these pictures because uh there's no description usually this site uh vndb will have a brief description of the game uh, under its description header, but this just has like a dash. There's no description for the game, so I wasn't able to play enough to really get the plot down. So it just has a a giant anime heart and then just tears coming out of Pretty its much. eyes. Pretty much, what it seems like. <laughs> like anime eyes on a heart and then crying <laughs> coming out and then giant lips. Yes, <laughs> that is it. Uh, Facelips. Yes, facelips. Yes. <laughs> so the next track we're going to play is uh, an OPN track, and this one blew me away. Uh, I've been holding on to this track for months. It's Possessioner, and it's the 1994 release. This is Labotech slash Dr. Lashmar, and it's by Hiroaki Sano and Masahiro Kajihara. This is a jam. Let's take a listen. Good. Possessioner, 1994, Labatech, Dr. Lashmar is the name of the track. Oh my god, so good. Hiroaki Sano <laughs> and Masahiro Kajihara made that glorious OPN track. Once again, your favorite track is the one I'm least impressed with. This, well, <laughs> this one is my second favorite. Oh, okay. This one is my second favorite. This one is my second favorite. <laughs> so this is, this is developed and released by Queensoft. Oh, Freddie Mercury's company. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Here in a brief Japanese visual novel company. Absolutely. Well, uh, okay, so you didn't like this one. No, no, no. I, I didn't okay. say I didn't like it. I said it was my least favorite. I mean, I'm more like, like you know, groove, blah, 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 blah. We've talked yeah. about it a million times. This is very fuzzy, very fast. Uh, not fuzzy as, and fast. Yeah, not as, not as dynamic as I really like tracks to be. I do like FM metal tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just... This one... This would be right out of a shooter, like a shmup. Yeah, exactly. That like a dun, really frenetic... It's just like really chuggy and heavy. I think in a game, yeah. I would like it a lot more than just listening to by it. itself. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I'm mm -hmm. not, not, not going to say I don't like sure, it. Sure, sure. Okay. This is, you know, my bread and butter. I've said it time and time again. It's 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 shreddy. It's chuggy. It's heavy. Got it's a very awesome. like Iron Maiden feel to it. I would say this is more thrashy than anything. Uh, Maiden 
has a little bit more melody in it, mm. and it it's got a they've got a bigger focus on like uh, dual octaves. This didn't really have as much of that. It was more. It also had like some weird instruments in the oh, background. Yeah, you know what it really reminded me of now that I think because I'm, I'm trying to think where I remember this mm. style song from. Yes. Um, Devil's Crush. Okay. On the TurboGrafx 16 has yeah. a very similar like guitar chuggy mm-hmm. sound to it. Yeah. So yes, that's pretty pretty accurate. That, that and um, that shooter, that uh, Soldier Blade. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. very similar to that. Definitely. So just really heavy and shreddy and chunky, and I don't know. It's like the the buffalo chicken pizza with a side of blue cheese. And that's, I don't care for blue cheese. So maybe there you that's go. There you perfect. Go. Yep, yep. If it had ranch, maybe I'd like it a little more. Maybe. A little but this twang. Is, this is a this is a blue cheese exclusive <laughs> track. All right. So uh, this game, the story takes place in the year of twenty thirty five. And not that far away. No, not at all. And uh, basically what's happening is these young girls are disappearing. Nobody knows why. Nobody can figure it out. And they end up returning, but they are totally like brainwashed. And they're basically zombies of these bionic uh, monsters. And uh, they're like taking out like human colonies and places, like living spaces. These women were called possessioners. So there was a uh, special all-female squad, which I don't know why it's always an all-female squad. Like, there can't be one guy on the team that's like, hey, maybe I could be on this team, please. <laughs> no, it's just like all women. And and don't get me wrong, I'm all about celebrating girl power. That's awesome. But, uh, of course, uh, the fact that it's an all-female squad ne- is You know of, why it's an all-female squad. You know squad, why. Especially for a PC-98. Yes. It's not you, like they're trying to be like... You know why. Yeah, equal opportunity here. Right, right. <laughs> they're... they're they're, they're equal opportunity in the sense that they will all get naked. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So exactly. Possessioner uh, is a adventure style game and a uh, player selects from different verbal commands uh, on the menu and then you combine that with like different objects that appear uh, to kind of interact with the environment. And, it's like a point and click kind of game. Yeah, kind of trigger special events and things like that. The navigation of course is menu based as well. It, it kind of contains like a, a turn-based battle system against these possessioner women. So there's four female combatants, and uh, you know they can attack with a variety of different attacks. But uh, the battles honestly are very simple, and there's not really it's not like our RPG where you know you're leveling up and you're getting different maps. Also, there's no advancement. It's no, just... not really. It's it's for the most part pretty basic. While looking up information for this game, there's uh, somebody on Patreon that's. Maybe not right now, but they were trying to uh, raise money to be able to like translate. Basically, it's like hmm. a part-time job. Like you pay me, and I will translate these games for you. And this was one of the top games that people had requested. So Interesting. I, I guess it's a pretty good game. From the what art I looks pretty good. Yeah, the art scenes, like the all the the cutscenes and everything, look really cool. Like all the cutscenes that they show on YouTube and everything, the game looks really nice cool. colors. Yeah, yeah, really vibrant, bright colors and everything. Uh, now the game, as we said. It does contain quite a bit of nudity and uh, exclusively lesbian sex scenes. Well, it's an all-female squad. All-female squad. There's no dudes, so, you know. There you go. Hey, man. It's catering to a particular audience. Yes. I'm okay with this. No, I figured as much. <laughs> hey, man. When you gotta make some omelets... May as well crack some eggs. You don't put sausage in the omelets. Yeah. You, you, okay. You know. You, you put eggs in the omelets. Hey, man, take another few semesters of Japanese and maybe you can get to those scenes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Big <laughs> it'll payoff. Just, it'll just be, uh, you know, me trying to figure out what else I could say with Tashiwa with. Right. <laughs> I am lesbian this. <laughs> so, Hiroaki Sano is a composer for only a few games. He actually did Gal Gun Double Piece. Mr. Happiness Edition in 2016, and Blaster Master Zero in 2017, who was the music composer and arranger on that. So he's done mostly programming over the years. He hasn't really done as much audio. This was like the one audio game that we could find with his name attached to it. Uh, mostly he's done programming and engineering for stuff like Battle Area Toshinden Remix, uh, Cyber Speedway in 1995, Linkle Liver Story in 96, uh, D2 in 99, he, he did programming, and Okage Shadow King in 2001, he did coding on. So he's mostly kind of stuck behind the scenes, not really a uh, composer. That's what I got for him. And then Masahiro Kajihara 
His name's a little more well known. I know we've covered tracks by him before. Well, he was the, the guy we just talked about that, that uh, pixelated audio interview. Yes, yes. Uh, he did Hole Chaser game design in 1990. But uh, audio wise, he did uh, Slayers in 1994. He did music and sound program support on that, which I believe that was the Super NES Super, or Super Famicom game exclusive to Japan, which was a uh, RPG based on the uh, Slayers franchise. It was actually the PC-98 version. Yep. Yeah. Cybernetic High School Part 3 Gunbuster, Task Force Harrier EX in 1991, Rusty in 93, which is a phenomenal soundtrack. Yep, one of those composers. Yes. Virgin Dream in 96, and Trigger Heart Excelica, which was his last audio game in 2007. He did background music and sound effects on yeah. it. Yeah. He also yeah. did Hole Chaser, which is what the... Um Pixelated audio interview yes. that focused on the soundtrack to that game. Absolutely. So that's the game. It's sexy fun for the whole family. <laughs> for the for for I guess the well, if the whole family's lesbians, then sure. and of age and of age. Yes, that's true. That's true. All right, so let's move on to our next one. Coming up is a soundtrack from Cross Changer, which came out in 1994, developed by Ucom. This is Action One by Suzunosuke. Kimikiri. That was Action 1 from Cross Changer, developed by Yukon, came out in 1994 on the PC-98, composed by Suzunosuke Himikiri. And that was an OPNA track. It was. Kind of a simple one. Yeah, I like the laid-back vibe on this one again. Uh, I like the that lead melody kind of gets stuck in your brain, that do-do-do-do-do. Do-do. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. It feels... Kind of simple, almost like it's a 2203 track yep. at the beginning, but then you get that kind of Rhodes organ that comes in towards the end, and it feels just so smooth and jazzy. Yeah. And then you kind of understand that, oh, maybe this is an OPNA track, because you really can't get that kind of sound. That's where those operators come in. Mm. To get a sound, a rounded sound like that, you need more operators to manipulate those sine waves to right. make it kind of sound like a different instrument. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's where that comes from. There's some nice like stereo tom effects that go back and forth to kind of accentuate the the melody and stuff. This is called Action One, but it doesn't really feel like an action no. song to me at all. No, it no. It feels like maybe you've menu walked music. into either menu music or like you've walked into like a lounge okay. or like you know two characters are sitting having a cup of coffee, <laughs> chatting about the you know, weather. Guys and girls are making out, and the girl is just crying hysterically. hysterically right, t- tears everywhere. Right, right. Uh, that kind of a thing. So <laughs> I don't know. Action. No mm, idea. Not so much. Susan Osage Himakiri was credited for Cross Changer and another game called Bakuretsu Quiz Tatake Materuna. Both were published by Yukom. That's all I really got for him. Okay. Yukom uh, also developed a game called Cherry Moderate and Bunkasai for the PC-98. I don't have credits for those games, but it's possible he wrote those soundtracks too. Yukom was a pretty small publisher. They only put out a few games. I guess they didn't credit their games very well either, so... Cherry Moderate is just a one-button game where you have this uh, anime character and he's eating cherries. So you have to press the button to make him eat cherries. But not too fast. And not too fast. And not if too you, slow. And not too slow. If you <laughs> eat them too fast or too slow, uh, there's a little character that comes out on the screen and it's like, whoa, whoa, slow down. Or, whoa, whoa, you're going too fast. You got it all wrong. 
That's a PC ninety eight game. It has to be a girl eating a oh, roll of cherries. Well, okay. and if she goes too fast, her clothes come off. Yes, of and course. If she goes too slow. Clothes go off anyway. Off anyway. No right. Right. I Maybe like, they come off if it's moderate. They, yeah. they go back on if you go too fast or right. too slow. I, I don't like, know what the reward system is I feel here. like we sh we could write a commercial on that. Ugh. Yeah. A terrible one. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, as far as the game goes, a scout ship called Flam of the Evil Alien Association Space Syndicate landed on the Earth and started kidnapping people. Yeah. The Planet Minority Galactic Federation Organization. Is that like a... Like a Pumugfo. Like anagram? Pumugfo. Pumugfo. Warned the Earth government and suggested... The Earth government. Yes, warned the... I guess there's one giant government, one. which is fine. I mean, that's what we're all working towards. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, they suggested creating an anti-alien defense force. So uh -huh. this defense force called Cross Changer was created, but Flam destroyed it anyway. Of so course. So why bother? Yeah. Uh, the surviving members of this Cross Changer organization have to sell information to evil organizations, but three girls, Marie, June, and May, decide to fight... On their own. Preferably without clothes. Preferably, you know, I don't know. This is a very cartoony game. Okay. So maybe like panties and bras, not completely naked. Uh, well, I'm talking cartoony in the sense of like old style, like, um, I'm not going to say like as far back as Astro Boy, but maybe like Speed Racer so style. So older style anime. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. the 70s, very 80s. Very big eyes, kind of angular, yep. squarish eyes on the bottom. And spoilers... This does have nudity. Of course it has nudity. Yes. There are very few visual novel games on this system that do not. That's true. But it looks good. Yeah. No, it does. I mean, it, it has a much more, like, classic vibe to it. It's it's definitely like the Project Aiko kind of style. Yeah. That, that old school, like, retro anime, which is always good. Exactly. And yeah. the rest of the soundtrack is really good, too. Even though, you know, this composer doesn't have too much credit uh, the rest of it's kind of jazzy as well so it's okay. a it's a good listen uh, especially when you have action scenes that sound like this mm -hmm. the other scenes are even more kind of like slower and so somebody that really enjoys slow music like mike mcdaniel or something you know might really enjoy some of the other sure. tunes on this because it's a very low-key soundtrack absolutely all right let's move into our next game which is virgin angel you can only guess what this one's about. 1995 was the year release. This is Virgin Angels Theme 2, also known as the Staff Roll, and it's by Sen Shibata. And this is an OPNA track, developed and published by Crystal Soft. Let's give it a listen. Crystals aren't soft. <laughs> These are. I don't understand. back that was virgin angel 1995's release the track virgin angels theme 2 staff roll by sen shibata and that is an opna track the game developed and published by crystal soft wow great track yeah it's got a nice bounce to it dun, 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 dun. it feels very upbeat and happy uh the 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 melody or the line that you're referring to is the twarmpy bass. Yes. Yeah, it does have a twarmpy <laughs> bass. Um, I feel like this game might have a very happy ending based on that music. Oh, oh very happy ending. <laughs> uh, this song was really, like, this is something that, you know the composer did uh, Don't Worry Be Happy? Yeah. The the song. Bobby. Bobby. 
Bobby. Yeah. Bobby's world. Yeah, him. <laughs> uh, so he this this seems like I, I picture him whistling that. Okay. That or this could be a Lionel Lionel Richie track. Do, 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 no, like the the do 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 do. Yeah, you know, it's in the same key, same cadence. Yeah. Like I feel like he could snap along to it. Da 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 da. It's very like post disco esque '80s pop music right there. Yeah. I love love that kind of music. It's got a post twarp kind of feel. Post twarp. Well, the bass is is is. In the moment, twarp. <laughs> twarp needs to be a modern real verb. Twarp. Yeah, modern twarp. T w a r m p. T w a r n m p. Oh, twarp. N n in there. Twarp. 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 Yeah, we're yeah, getting it, too intense here. Way yeah. too intense. Uh, yeah. Speaking of twarps, so this game uh, it takes place in the year 2080 in Tokyo. Essentially, uh, the, it became a location where they did crazy scientific experiments uh, in a uh, spaceship, and uh, there's all kinds of organized crime. And there's so this wait, new... Tokyo is a center for daring scientific experience, newest research in spaceship technology, and, and organized, organized crime. crime. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's a new drug that has been created that enhances sexual experiences of human beings. Eventually, subduing their will and turning them into slaves of whoever possessed that drug. Sounds convenient. So if you give the drug to a girl and she takes it, she is your slave at that point. What if I give the drug to your dog? Then the dog is your sex slave, oh. basically. That's gross, dude. So, I mean, come on. Have some class here. I'm just, <laughs> you know, yeah. daring the scientific experiments. That's, that's yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So a uh, there's a, a police force that was created to investigate these crimes uh, and figure out what what the deal is with them uh, and also to find the criminals. Hey, what's that... the deal with these drugs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's uh, this ain't no Viagra. Yeah, no, definitely not. This is like super super ultra awful Viagra. Yes, I don't know. yes. So the the person that you play as is a young female investigator named Amano. Murakumo. That's pretty much it. So Virgin Angel is actually a visual novel, and it uh, pretty much plays like all the games, other games that we've been talking about. There's no command verbs of any kind, though. Uh, so comparatively, like many points during w which the player has to decide what to do next, some of these decisions may lead to like the premature end of the game. So, oh, so it's a game you can actually lose. Yeah, you can actually lose in this game and start the game over, or you know. Yeah. Uh, the game, I guess, uh, contains some sexual scenes, mostly of lesbian kind. That we looked up some. Saying. We looked up some pictures, and uh, let I me feel tell dirty. you, yeah, I'm no longer a virgin angel. No, you are not. <laughs> Ed, Ed definitely became a little hot under the collar. <laughs> I was, I was sitting here. We're listening to the track, and we're looking at pictures, and <laughs> Ed's eyes went wide looking at some <laughs> of the photos. <laughs> They are pretty graphic for a, for a video game. Yeah. I agree. I mean, this is totally an adult-oriented game. I've never really played like anything beyond mature rated. I, I I would say that I think Leisure Suit Larry is about as mature as I've gotten in a video game. Yeah, I I mean probably the Sinran Kagura games is probably oh, yeah. the more mature, most mature game that well, I've played in terms of mature. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, sexy girls right, right. jiggling the about the most adult content, I guess. We could say. Uh, correct. Yes. So this though is wow. Yeah, it, it's straight up hentai. They I leave mean, nothing for the imagination. No, Sen Shibata worked on pretty much this and has been credited for programming and engineering for a game called Laptic in 86. Laptic? Laptic. Oh. Yeah. I thought we were still Get on the your same. mind out of the gutter, hey, buddy. And Jack Brothers in 1995. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make that up. Uh, he's labeled under business for Atlas Software. Gotcha. Uh, Jack Brothers is that uh, game that came out for the Virtual Boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yep. yep. Very expensive Virtual Boy game. Yep. Yes. Ain't no virtual boys allowed near this virgin angel. All right. So, uh, I don't know. You want to move on to a non-visual novel for a change? Uh, sure. sure. As but only if it has sexy girls in it. I mean, that is the Well, motif. you're in luck. Yes. Next up is a track called Hard Rushing from the game... <laughs> 
Go on. From the game Night Slave. This one was composed by Yuki Nakayama, otherwise known as Panda. This is an OPM Panda. shock. Yeah, Panda. All right, then. All right. Hope you enjoyed that little drum solo there. That was Hard <laughs> Rushing from Night Slave. Came out in 1996. Composed by Nuki. I keep saying Nuki. Composed by Yuki. <laughs> <laughs> what is so funny? Nuki. Nuki. <laughs> Nuki Yakiyama. No. Uh, composed by Yuki Nakayama. Otherwise, or better known as Panda. And that was for the OPN chip on the PC. 98. This is a great groove. Yes. This is a great track. Uh, the first thing that grabbed me was the use of chords. Dun, mm. dun, 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 and then like little harmonies and harmonics between those two notes yep. uh, were really well done. And then he just kind of blends these melodies into that backbeat. Uh, and even though it's a OPN track, which, you know, by, by this point when this game was out... Um, the OPNA chip was available. So right. they could have used it if they want to. Sure. But they made such good use of the OPN chip on this game that they didn't even need to move over to the more powerful stuff. Yeah, sometimes you could do so much with a chip that's been fully developed where all the secrets are kind of out for it so you can kind of learn what you can and can't do on that. And, the, and this system has been out for so long and the chip has been out for so long that you can really build some incredible music and that's why you you know with later releases of games you tend to see like some of the best and most like amazing content come out musically and even graphically too yeah yeah for sure and you know with this one uh, this was the first PC-98 game I ever played, and I've played it quite a bit, actually. Hmm. It is an action game. It's very similar to, like, uh, Cybernator, okay. or the Assault Suit uh, Valken. Assault or suit? Assault Suit Lanos. Lanos, stuff yeah. like that, yeah. Yep. Uh, so you're in a, you know, a mech. You can move your arm up and down to shoot. You can hover. You can go back and forth. You can kind of strafe. You know, you can walk backwards while facing forwards. Mm. That kind of deal. And it's a, it's a full-on action game. There's a lot of stuff moving around. Unfortunately, because it is the PC-98, the... Scrolling isn't so smooth, so mm. it's like 15 frames per second. So sure. You can definitely tell there's frame draws. Mm -hmm. Makes it a little bit more difficult to play, but you've got like full screen enemies, really, really well done music, as we've just heard. Some cool like 3D star field effects. It's a really well done game. And in between, you get a team of female 
military futuristic <laughs> mech pilots who find themselves in adult situations for well, no particular reason other than... I mean, you, you did say that your arm goes up and down yeah, when, you, when you shoot. That's so, true. Hey. Yeah, you can hover for a bit. Yeah, yeah. And then slam back down. Yep, yep. Um, this is a game, though, that does have an option in the menu to turn off the... Uh, explicit scenes. Really? So it was kind of made for both audiences. I guess if you're just a gamer or if you, your kid wanted to play it or something, you could turn that off and they could okay. just play the game. And I think it would still get cutscenes. It would just delete the parts that had sexual content. Graphic sex. In it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, it was. It's a, it's a really good game. It's definitely worth checking out. You don't need to know a lot of Japanese to play it, which is fantastic. That's good. So similar to Rusty, also that game that we played at the beginning of the show, Metal and Lace, very easy to get in there, select your character, and start you know playing the one-on-one -on -one fighter. Mm. So these, those are at least three games we can recommend to you guys if you want to get into PC98 emulation uh, to get get some games going, find out yeah. what the system is all about. Yeah, if you want a little bit more in-depth look at at the PC98, check out my Rusty review that I did for Dude You oh, Played This Game. Really in-depth review where I talk about one of the best games on the PC98, uh, which is Rusty, pretty much a Castlevania clone. Absolutely. So what about this composer, Panda? Yeah, Yuki Nakayama <laughs> goes by the alias Panda for composition, but then just as Yuki Nakayama for other roles. Oh. Um, he mostly produced music for adult games, a former member of Doors Music Entertainment, and is also the founder and company representative of Panda House. So he's got his own production company as well. Mm. He started off in 1989 with Lipstick ADV for developer Fairy Tale, and he worked on and off for them for the next few years. He joined up with the developer Cats Pro in the mid-90s and did a few series with them, like Cats and Heart Heat Girls. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting to note that around 93 and 94, he was composer, scenario writer, and director on a few visual novels, like Fetchy and Nova. After that, he composed full-time on more visual novels, like Argonauts and Pato Girl, for his own company, Panda House, Fairy Tale, and Melty Kobu. Huh. Yeah, so Interesting. very prolific, very talented, obviously can design games as well as write really, really good music. So when you look up, you know, Panda as far as music goes, he, he's one of the more well-known, like uh, Masahiro Kajiwara. Yeah. Um, one of the more well-known composers that came out of the uh, Japan FM scene back in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, this is very similar to Assault Suit Lanos, and uh, so if you like those types of games, Cybernator, yeah, no, this all is that definitely a game stuff. to check out if yeah, you want to get Metal into... Warriors, yeah, it's good stuff, yeah. For sure. Plus you get girls in tight clothes, and that's always a good thing too. So, moving on to more girls in tight clothes, this is Silent Mobius. I said it's a theme in this episode. Uh, possibly. <laughs> it's kind of unavoidable. Silent Mobius, Case Titanic Reproduction in 1990. And the track is Silent City. This is also by Masahiro Kajiwara and Hiroe Suga. And this is an OPN track. Give it a listen. Man, 
I sure do love the PC-98, but I'm tired of emulating it. In the games, the translations just suck. What's an obscure otaku gamer guy to do? Are you tired of this being something you'd say? Well, yeah, I mean, I just said I'm sick of it. Well, then you'd better hold on to your Funyuns, because have I got the computer for you. Introducing the PC-108. Funyuns? Really? That's the part that you're going to question? The PC-108 is the latest in the line of Japanese-based computer systems from NEC, back from the dead and ready to impress. Cool. What hardware specs does it have? Featuring an assortment of over 1,000 colors, a Motorola processor from the year 2003, and an Intel Pentium dual-core processor, this baby is ready to move full speed ahead. Plus, coupled with a Yamaha 2842 sound chip that features OPNA Shananana, you're in for some slap bass from the gods. OPNA Shananana? I don't even know what that means, but tell me more. Do you like your visual novels? Heck yeah, I do. And how about dirty, filthy hentai? Well, I don't really like to advertise, but... Of course you do, you dirty, filthy man-baby. Well, how about games that feature a quadruple X rating? Sweet Funyun Lords, what kinds of kinky debauchery are you spewing, announcer man? It's a new series of visual novels that are so dirty, so filthy, so disgustingly perverted, the screen is just black with text and nobody even talks about smut. That's... hotter than Funyuns. Buy the PC-108 today for the low price of 400,000 yen, and we'll even throw in a PCM CIA card so you can connect to the internet via Windows ME. Uh, I gotta... I, I, I gotta... I gotta find my wallet right now! Send 400,000 yen to NEC, 101 Johnson Avenue, Osaka, Japan, 8675309 today. Imaginary giblets, here I come. Welcome back! That was Silent Mobius, Case Titanic Reproductions, the 1990 release. That was Silent City, and the track was by Masahiro Kajiwara and Hiroe Suga, and that was an OPN track, and the game was developed by Gainax Inc. These Silent Mobius guys really like their bass lines, huh? Oh my goodness. So if, for those of you who are familiar, we previously played a Silent Mobius track on the episode 60 Free Picks Gaiden episode, as well as episode 100, where we revisited that same track for the 100th episode. Right, that was Battle with Ghosts? Yes, Battle with Ghosts. And that was the Sharp X68000 version of the track. Right. And that came out uh, a that year the later. OPM in version. The YM2151. Right. So, I love this track. I love the groove. I, I, I am all about groove when it comes to funky bass. Mm. And this track is full of funky bass. It, it's a slower track, and it's also a more pronounced track. And what I love about that bass line is just how funky it gets, how groovy it gets, and it really is the star of, of the track. But one thing that I, I, I picture in my head, there's that ding 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 in my head, I picture this is like the stakeout track. I don't know what part of the game <laughs> this okay, is from, yeah, yeah. but I, I picture somebody trying to light a cigarette, and that ding 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 is like them trying to light with the okay, cigarette. like the flint, yeah, trying to yeah, like yeah. with the flint, and they finally get it lit, and then it's just like Groove City, man. It's, that's, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, I, I yeah. got a very kind of like. Uh, Downward Spiral era Nine Inch Nails vibe to it, like the end of that album, like the like the track called Reptile is mm -hmm. very very slow, but like very kind of like slow machines grinding against each other, okay. kind of a feel. Mm. Or uh, Final Fantasy VI, I think it's the Devil's Lab track. Okay. 
has a kind of a similar slow feel to this with mm. a really intense kind of percussion going for it. Yeah, it's definitely telling a story. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not a track where it's like an action battle theme no, or anything like that. No, definitely a sneaky kind of uh, streetlights overhead kind yeah. of a feel, maybe a rainy evening or something. Yep. But Silent City is a great name for this because that's exactly what I'm picturing in my head. Yeah, You know, definitely. a very quiet city kind of as where you're kind of waiting for something, but it isn't, you're not waiting for something like to ambush an enemy. You're waiting for an enemy that you might want to follow somewhere or spy on somebody. You're not waiting for Guffman. Right. And you're not waiting to exhale. <laughs> <laughs> this is based on the manga and anime. I give uh, up. By the, uh, the anime artist and manga artist. Uh, Once Ke- a month is too much. Yeah. <laughs> Kia As- Asamiya, and we talked about him uh, really briefly earlier in the episode. He's a he, he has a very distinct style where he draws noses really big. Mm. Uh, I don't know why, but he's very pointy at the very end. Very pointy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody's and, got uh, their own thing, you know. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So, of course, this game focuses on a group of female supernatural cops who are trying to stop invading alien life forces called the Lucifer Hawks, and they use mystic abilities to defeat their foes okay so the game specifically presents an original episode of that series uh, of the manga and the anime well specifically the i guess you could say kind of a hybrid of both because it's not really necessarily animated but at the same time it's not exactly a manga either yeah so it's kind of like a in-between sort of thing but uh you mean a visual novel yeah yeah exactly (laughs) so you're in tokyo and upon closer inspection of uh the strange ship that they are on reveals that the ship appears to be an identical match to the famous rms titanic ship that sank in 1912 in the Atlantic Ocean. So there's this unknown male protagonist who boards the ship along with the heroines Rally, Kitty, Nami, or Na- Nami, and other heroines from the manga uh, series. Yeah, so, so the nameless male protagonist is basically who you're playing as. Like, that's right. your, your surrogate. Correct, yes. So you're kind of placing yourself in the story with the characters right. from... From uh, Silent Mobius. It's not quite harem style in the sense that, you know, this dude is... You know, surrounded by all these beautiful women, and he's kind of the you know center of attention. It's more like you're a guy helping these girls solve this mystery. Yeah. So the gameplay is more like it's more Japanese style visual novel, less like puzzle esque, like adventure format. So it's not really that. Uh, the entire game is set when you're on that Titanic ship. You can visit various different areas of the ship in any order, so it's completely non-linear, uh, and you can access certain locations. Though certain locations access is restricted and necessary events have to be triggered in order to access those parts of the... Like battling with ghosts. Yes. Which we recommend you hang out and listen to the bass solo. Absolutely. (laughs) So there's three commands, look, talk, and move, that are used on most of the screens and there's no inventory management of any kind, which is always nice. Standard visual novel fare. Yes, pretty much. So I've seen the anime for this. I actually own the one that came out in like the late 90s and uh it's pretty interesting i mean it, it's a cool idea where you have this series that kind of takes place in the past but then it kind of moves into the like you know futuristic sci-fi era neat and um you know the the main uh, heroine is this girl who basically wants nothing to do with any of this sort of thing and she gets kind of roped into it and then she kind of yeah, becomes part of this police force this uh, the silent mobius protagonist gotcha yep very cool. so very neat so initially at the beginning of this break we talked about uh, the composer one of the composers being masahiro kajiwara it's actually masahiro kajahara but labeled as masahiro kajiwara he has di- various different uh, two different variations for his name one is just M. Kajihara, and the other is Masahiro Kajiwara. I'm not sure as to why there's a mix-up of those two names, but... It might be the, the Japanese character can be pronounced either way, depending on how you look um, at it. Possibly. That would be a better question for <clears throat> somebody who actually knows a right. lot more about Japanese exactly. Which than Which is why I I'm speculating. Yes, yes. Hiroe Suga worked on two different games, Denue Gakuen. In 1990, I'm probably butchering that. And then, <laughs> thank you. And then Cybernetic High School Part Three Gunbuster in 1990 as well. I wish I went to a cybernetic high school. 
Yeah, I wish my name was Gunbuster. Gunbuster. <laughs> Gunpuncher. Gunpuncher. From Undercover Cops. Yes, yes. My favorite villain of all time. Absolutely. All right, what do you got next for us? Next up, oh, actually, this is one of my favorites of the show. This is from uh, Waku Waku Mahjong Panic 2. This is a track called Totsugeki, which means either rush or assault in English. This is composed by Kazumichi Moegi. It's an OPNA track. Let's give it a listen. Welcome back. That was Totsugeki from Waku Waku Mahjong Panic 2 from 49 and Excellence, released in 1996, composed by Kazumichi Moegi on the YN2608 OPNA chip. One of my favorites. I love this groove. It's got such a nice kind of walking bass, and then it goes through all these different parts, and it feels like kind of comedic, but kind of energetic like a really funny boss is coming after you like Parodius or something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I like the beginning part that like almost like trip hop kind of hip hop mm, style. Yeah, yeah. That that was really cool. And then it kind of moves into this vibe that I got that was like a pseudo 50s kind of like sock hmm. hop kind of vibe okay. to it. I don't know, like that that end part, the the second part of the the track just kind of has like a 50s vibe to it for whatever reason for me. Okay, I guess I, I kind of can feel that. Yeah. I mean, that bass line's kind of like dun, 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 yeah. boom, 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 And I really love the transitions between each part because there's agree. lots of like little time jumps and breakdowns mm-hmm. in between each one. And you're like always kind of like, oh my God, what's coming up next? This is going to be really awesome. And it usually is. So. Yeah, this doesn't sound anything like anything else that we heard so far in the episode, which yeah. I really dig. I'm, I'm glad that you picked this track because it really showcases how the composers really tried to bring something different to each and every game that they worked on. So with something like this, it definitely has that more fun, lighthearted vibe, which kind of matches with the art style too. The art style is very like, very bright, very cheery. You know, most of the characters are very exaggerated anime style. So absolutely. So it's it's really matching. It it, it looks the part and matches it with the, the sound. But again, this is a, a, a pretty based on the uh, cover. It's a sexual style game. I mean, you got a girl bent over, an elf girl bent over with uh, penny shots galore. Yeah, so. I don't think this is so much of an adult game. I mean, I think there's a little bit in there here and there, but it's yeah. more like teasing kind of stuff rather right. than full on like. Oh yeah, you know, like uh, Virgin Angel. Like Virgin Angel stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's not meant to take your virginity. It's more. Right. It's more there to tantalize. 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 Yeah. So this might be rated R as opposed to like the NC-17 that the other games are. I'd say I'd say PG-13. Okay. Now I mean, I really, I I don't know whether there's actual nudity or not in this game, so. Uh, yeah. uh, But we can find out because this is one of the very few visual novels that we're talking about today that actually does have an English release. Oh, sweet. Yeah, this came out by the name of Fairy Nights in the year 2000, which was four years after it came out on the PC-98. Wow. 
Uh, it's a linear visual novel with Mahjong battles interspersed throughout. So even though it's in English, you still have to know how to play Mahjong. Which True. I've tried so many times to figure <laughs> out and I cannot do it. So this is part of the Fairy Gods series. It features the Shikigami sisters Kumi and Kokaku, and they are called back to the fairy village, and Django must accompany them or risk losing them forever. And what they find along the way are danger, betrayal, and Django's confrontation with an ancient legend. The plans of a an organization. It's a cap organization with a capital O. They are laid bare. <laughs> and deep bonds between Django and his fairies, especially Dear Kumi, are sorely tested in the conclusion of the Fairy Gods series. So that is the English description on the back of the box when it came out in 2000. Fun. Yeah, I mean, it's a really bright, cartoony kind of game. It might be a good, if there's a good tutorial, it might be a good way to learn how to play Mahjong. I, yeah. don't, I don't really know. Yeah, especially if it's in English. Yeah. So, uh, as far as the composer is concerned, Kazumichi Moegi also goes by the alias Hitomi Daikinsei. Hitomi Daikinsei sounds more like the real name, so I'm not sure which one is mm -hmm. the alias and which one right. is the other way around. He uh, started his career in 1992 with the visual novel Armist for the developer Basement, which is probably where the game was developed. <laughs> Moved over to developer 4.9 in 93, which created this game, and composed 17 games with them over the next four years, mm. including Waku Waku Mahjong Panic and this game that we're talking about, the sequel. Uh, around 1997 or so, he composed less and less and became a scenario writer and bounced around between a few different developers, setting at developer Hao until 2006. He was out of the biz from 2006 onward, uh, according to what I can find. And then he came back to visual novels one last time in 2014 with Saikatsu Mina Daisuke Kimete Aero Lab for developer Mother Goose. Oh, Mother Goose. So, uh... That's exactly what I think of when I think of these kind of games. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely want to find more soundtracks that he's done hmm. because I really like this whole soundtrack. Yeah. This is, like, my favorite of the show so far. I, and the I, rest of the soundtrack is pretty good. The rest of the soundtrack's really good. Mm. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Very cool. Uh, and, and, you know, because of the English translation, I'm, I'm trying to, you know... I wonder how good it is because the English translation or the English version of the game is for DOS. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if the music is going to be as good because it's going to be, I think, probably MIDI or ad lib oh, instead of right. uh, 2608. Right. So it might be a little less quality, but it would be yeah. cool to actually be able to play one of the games we're featuring. Have to track today it down, yeah. That isn't uh, an action game. So. Yes. So yeah, definitely a game to, to check out if you can find the DOS version. You might have to run it in like an emulator like DOSBox or something. I doubt it'll run on Windows 10. But no. But give it a shot. might be cool. Yeah, definitely. All right, what you got for your last track of the day? Last track is from a game called Trouble Outsiders, and this, I believe, came out in 1996. I couldn't really find a specific date, but I believe it's 96. Uh, this track is A Battle with Destiny, and it's by Shiori Ueno, and it's an OPNA track. Pick your jaws and ears off the floor. That was Trouble Outsiders. 
1996 release composed by Shiori Ueno. It's an OPNA track. The track name is A Battle with Destiny, and man, that was amazing. Yeah, that was really good. Very heroic sounding, very... Yep video game sounding yes. so you know a little less like a visual novel game than most of these other tracks where they're kind of like laid back and something you can listen to on a loop for a long time yeah this one's got a very driving feel to it very nice harmonies and very mm -hmm. like textured tones to it the 2608 really shines with the multiple channels on this one i think and then it's yeah. got that galloping bass that you love so much I wouldn't quite say it's galloping, but I, I would say that it's very strong. Mm -hmm. And what I love about this track is that, you know, I love the melody and everything. Uh, it's very uplifting, very heroic, as we said. But I love that the second time around, not the second loop, but the second time that the bass kind of continues, mm -hmm. it gets louder and more pronounced. Yeah. It's it's almost as if they just like jacked up the volume on the <laughs> on that bass guitar and you just like it goes from like doom dicka doop doop dicka doop doop kind of like hovering in the background doom dicka doop doop dicka doop doop down dicka doop it's yeah. like more and more pronounced and just strong. This is just such a beefy tight track. It's really, really good. The loop ends really well, too, with that little bass solo yeah, and the, the drum do, 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 fill. Do, 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 do. Yeah, and it yeah. rolls back in. Yeah. That's a great way to, to introduce a new loop. It's really the only way you could have ended a track like this, because it's <laughs> so powerful throughout yeah. the entire experience. You need that little break to kind of like reset yourself yep. before you go back into that groove again. And I love that melody that, that kind of comes in right when the bass goes more and more prominent. It's almost as if the track is just keeps running, and, and Instead of like running out of steam, it's just going even like faster. I'm gonna do more. Harder. Watch me go. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so it's good stuff. The game is well, really, I couldn't find that much on it, unfortunately. But uh, I can tell you that a Westerner killer is hired in Ichigoya of Edo period as a bodyguard. So the Edo uh, period is the same period that like uh, Legend of the Mystical Ninja, yes. the Goemon series right, takes the Goemon place, series. if you want a visual reference yep. for that. <clears throat> Old school Japanese, you know, traditional yeah. style. This killer, his self-acclaimed disciple heroine, wants to compete with him at every step. Uh, perhaps together they will save the world. Ah, uh, okay. So this is a comedy work with a heroine who is constantly harassing a poker face hero. And little is known about the work, a part of that it's quite big in volume. You know, this is kind of an interesting track for a game that takes place in the Edo period, mm -hmm. because usually, you know, you're gonna get more traditional kind of Japanese sounding music for a historical game. But because this is a comedy, mm -hmm. it probably gives them a little artistic license for a more modern sounding soundtrack. Yeah, the art style in and of itself is, I mean, the clothes that the characters are wearing is definitely of that era, mm. but the style is a lot more, like, thicker and bigger in terms of, like, the way that, like, the characters look chunkier in a way, uh, at least as far as I could tell from the art that I found. Okay. Uh, which wasn't much, unfortunately. So not a lot known about this game, unfortunately. And again, it's all in Japanese, so it's going to be, uh, there's no, as far as I know, there's no English translation. So yeah. So not even fan translation. I'd like to load this up on an emulator and see how far it can get through, because this is the only game where I really don't even have any screenshots right. of how it looks. So yeah, that would yeah. be cool to do. Yep. So Shiori Ueno worked on three games other than this, Ever, uh, as, far as, as far as we could tell. <laughs> uh, 1994's Slayers, which we already talked about before, Tenshimuyo Ryoki, and Tenshimuyo Ryoki FX. And that was 95 and 96, respectively. So those are the games that he or she worked on. I also have Koto Higaoka Monogatari. Okay. And Yatsu no Nawa Diamond. Those are the ones that are listed on the visual novel data. Right, right, right. He was okay. listed as composer for all those. So, yeah, active between like 94 and 97. Yep. Kind of faded off, turned into a ninja. So, the Tenchi Moyo games are obviously based on the Tenchi Moyo series. So. And that probably would have been a pretty good, pretty big game because that's a pretty popular license. Yeah, I mean, so. that game specifically came out on the PC FX. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, that's it. So, bye. I'm, oh, wait, got one more track. <laughs> I'm out of tracks, but Ed's still got one final one. So oh, boy. What do you got for us? We've got one more left. This game. This is Amy to Yobanaide, otherwise known as Don't Call Me Amy, developed <laughs> by Seasware in 1995. This track is called Tumomi-kun, and we could not do a PC-98 episode without featuring something 
by Ryu Umemoto. Yes. This is an OPNA track. Enjoy. Don't call me Amy. <laughs> Welcome back. That was Please Don't Call Me Amy. Please. 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 Also uh, known as Amy's Fantasies. I guess there's an English version of this, which I just found out while I was listening to the song. Wait, so... Or it, Amy to Yabanaidi. Right, right. But, so it's Don't Call Me Amy, but then it's also known as Amy's Fantasies. Yes. So it's like, does she want you to call her Amy? Well... As I describe the storyline, you'll mm. understand why. Alrighty. So uh, this was composed by Ryu Umemoto. Uh, the song title was Tomomi-kun, developed by Seas Ware. It came out in 1995, uh, again, for the OPNA sound chip. Seas Ware, the same company that did Rusty, no? Yes. Yes. Yeah, same guys. Yep. So this has a very, like, gospel feel to it, especially with those backing organs. Yeah. Um, this is a great ending track. It is. Like, And that's kind of why I picked it for this. You nailed it. Very emotional. Yes. Uh, so Tomomi Kuhn getting into the plot of the game uh, <laughs> is this high school girl named Emmy, who it falls in love with his her stepbrother named Tomomi. Oh wow! And okay. so Tomomi, I guess, owes some people some money. Of course. Uh, not the right people at all. So his debtors show up, ransack the place, take all that he owns, and also kidnap him. Mm-hmm. So it's up to Emmy to get her stepbrother back and along the way somehow which it doesn't really describe in the uh synopses that i've read reasons unknown ends up discovering that she has an alternate personality named amy okay that's why it's called don't call me amy i guess Mm. there's a kind of a split personality thing here okay but emmy while she's a very kind of shy innocent schoolgirl, amy is like this she has no morals at all. She... So in a hentai game, it's like she just does whatever the hell. Well, she I wouldn't wants. say that has anything to do with morals, but let's just say well, she's in very. Well, it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but let's just say she's very um, hands-on. Basically, yeah. I mean, Amy is trying to save herself for Tomomi, but you mean Emmy? Or Emmy is trying to is. save herself for Tomomi, and <laughs> Amy is like, no, nah, I'm not having any of that. I'm nah. doing whatever I want and whoever I want. That's right. And this is probably the most graphic game we're talking about. Oh, I'm really? not going to get into what's entailed but yeah it's kind of not okay suitable for work all right or life or- um <laughs> <laughs> oh ed so uh yeah so um we need to loosen you up you yeah, gotta have a good time yeah let amy amy let amy show you the way <clears throat> so it's basically a, a simple adventure um with a very simple interface and light gameplay with no puzzles it's got some humor in it but also heavy graphically explicit sexual content. Yes. Uh, the screenshots you can find online are very generously clean. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, if you compare that to, like, Virgin Angel, I would say Virgin Angel was way more graphic. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I, I mean, I've only read descriptions of what's included in this game, and, and I haven't seen the pictures, so... Oh, okay. I can, can only, only imagine what... It's only... S- sloshing around in this noggin, <laughs> trying to get it out from your your head would banging ace on my blows. ears. Uh, I was gonna say the visual style is very similar to Zatsuan Ryoki that we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah, game. kind of a more realistic. Yeah, it's got a more realistic look to it in terms of the characters. Everything looks more like less like sci-fi and and crazy and more like naturally, you know, like you would see it on regular everyday life. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Nito and the so, composer. Ah, uh, yes, Ryu Umemoto, yes. celebrated as one of the greatest FM composers to ever come out of Japan. Mm-hmm. Sadly, you know, passed away 
Fairly recently, uh, right? 2011. Yes. He was 37 years old. There was a game that he was working on that, if I recall, somebody finished it for him. I remember reading something about yeah, that. Yeah, there was a Kickstarter or something where they were going to remake a game. Yeah, and um, re-release it with, with... With his compositions. Yeah, but somebody helped finish the game because the game wasn't finished right. as far as the audio goes. And so they like created the music to be like similar to his style. To match what he'd already done right. for the game. Yeah. yeah. I guess he had chronic bronchitis. That's what he and, got And uh, it affected his lungs Jeez. and he just, yeah, so Hopefully it's very it unfortunate. Yeah. But he worked for Seasware and Elf Corporation. Tons of visual novels. One of his most popular soundtracks, at least in the States, is You Know, A Girl Who Chants Love with the Bound of This World. Yes. Uh, he also worked on Princess Maker 2, mm -hmm. Gundam, Macross, Musuhime, Sama, Futari, Black Label, Escaluda 2, Black Label, a lot of shooter, mo uh, the Cave shooters. Hell shooter games. Yeah, like Mushihime, Sama. Uh, Akai Katana, Nintu Jump. So, yeah, uh, his his stuff, I mean, if you find a Ryu Umemoto soundtrack, you're in for a treat. Because Ground Seed. He just, yeah, he did Ground Seed as well. He worked mm -hmm. a little bit on Rusty. Great composer that was sadly taken from us. Yeah, so. Uh, interestingly enough, little tidbit, his first video game that he ever played was Taito's Elevator Action in 1983. Taito Arcade, man. Yeah, man. Really influential on mm -hmm. lots of game developers. Agreed, agreed. So, uh, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed our little focus on the PC-98. Yeah and the two chips that came along with it. We are really interested in your feedback. So you can find this show on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Pixel Tunes Radio. Find the Post place it. where this show is posted <laughs> and leave your comments. Which was your favorite track? What do you think about the 2203 versus the 2608, the OPN and OPNA? Right. Which do you prefer to listen to? Mm -hmm. What were some of your favorite games? Which games do you want to learn more about? Do you know of any cool PC-898 PC-98 soundtracks you want to share with us. What was your favorite track of the night, Mike? My favorite track? Ooh, that's a tough one. There was a lot of really good stuff. Um, I gotta go with that. You know, I will say that the Virgin Angel track came pretty close to beating out the Possessor, or the Possessioner mm -hmm. track, uh, but Trouble Outsiders mm -hmm. is King. Uh, that track was phenomenal. I just... That's the track that I keep going back to that I totally found on accident. Hmm. And I just always keep going back to that track and listening to it. So without a doubt, Trouble, Trouble Outsiders. I almost, I keep wanting to say Troubleshooters. Trouble Outsiders, uh, which was my final track, that is definitely my favorite. Yeah, what Trouble Outsiders doesn't really roll off the no. tongue very well. Yeah. What about you? So uh, Waku Waku Mahjong Panic 2 with a very close runner-up for um, Don't Call Me Amy. <laughs> I really, really like that track. I mean, they're so different from each other. It's hard yeah. to like really because Don't Call Me Amy is so mature and so emotional. Mm -hmm. But then Waku Waku is just so out there and fun and yeah. frenetic. So it's like kind of comparing apples and oranges. Agreed. Um, I think Waku Waku has a better use of the OPNA chip. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Don't Call Me Amy just has a better composition. Yeah. That track was really good. Really, you can't go wrong with any of the music that we picked. I, I love everything that we picked here. So it's all really good stuff. And uh, so that's, Exactly. Yeah. And if you don't have a Facebook account, you can't comment on our Facebook group, you can head over to pixeltunesradio.com mm -hmm. and comment on our blog, or you can email us at pixeltunesradio at gmail.com yep. or catch us on Twitter. Twitter at uh, pixeltunesradio is our handle. Uh, you can also reach out to us on YouTube. You can check out the channel youtube.com forward slash dongled. And that is where all the Pixel Tunes radio episodes are up to date and will continue to be forever and always. And also just a brief note, uh, Ed and I were in the latest Dude You Haven't Played This Game, which should be out by now. It is for Battle Chasers Night War. So that is a... Uh, JRPG, which is kind of like a mix between Final Fantasy and Diablo. Definitely check it out. I spent 90 hours recording gameplay footage Holy for it. Holy crap. Yeah. Definitely the most time I've spent on a video game in a very, very long time. So definitely check out that review and uh, you could see it. It's It's got a very Pixel Tunes radio dynamic. It's very... As far I'm, as the live action sequences yeah, go, yeah, it's yeah. very skit feel to it. Definitely. Like, I'm the more, like, goofy one, and you're the more, like, straightforward one. So, you know, we kind of took that Pixel Tunes radio vibe and kind of moved it over to uh, the latest studio and played this game. So if you like our stuff, you may like that. 
bonus content. Yes. You can also check us out. Uh, well, not us, but you can check out Ed's side project, Impulse Project. Yep, impulseproject.info, where uh, myself and Brian from Pixelated Audio do a show all about the demo scene. So we cover chips from the Amiga to the Commodore 64, Genesis, Game Boy, you name it if it makes sounds, uh, and it's composed by an amateur and doesn't fit into a game, but might fit into like a tech demo or something like that, we share the music from that and share a little bit about the composers and stuff. So it's got a very Pixel Tunes feel, mm -hmm. but with a different type of chip music. Right, right. And less goofiness. And less goofiness. And less goofiness. talk about cheese and pickles. Correct. Yes. Yes. So, moving on, uh, episode 108 will be about isometric games. I'm kind of excited about that. We've never really done, like, a style of game. Yeah, it's a very loose theme, which I'm kind of interested in, because I think yeah. we get a lot of variety in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that will be out on the last Wednesday of March. Yes. Yeah, because keep in mind, we are doing monthly episodes now, which is great because it'll give you guys a chance to catch up if you aren't caught up. Uh, so you've got 107 episodes now to listen to, <laughs> so go back and check it and out. 30 days to do it. Yeah, do it. Or, or yeah. You've got to average like 3.2 3 episodes per day. Per day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us at Pixel Tunes Radio. Signing off. We'll see you guys in a month. And we'll see you guys online, too. Don't forget that. Absolutely. All right, peace out. Bye. Bye. So we're all three kukase We're all three kukase Yeah, man, I'm having a lot of trouble saying that. We're all three kukase Kaku. 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 Just remember cock. Yeah, I just remember cock. We're all three kaku. We're all three kaku. We're all three kaku is based on the adult anime.